So tell us your name and where you were born. Uh, my name is Jeff Burnett. Uh, I was born in Wichita Falls, Texas. And where did you go to uh, school? Went to, uh, moved right after uh, I was born to Dallas, and that's basically where I grew up. Uh, I did my high school work at Brian Adams High School in Dallas. And what is your role in the Pflugerville community today? Uh, my role in the community is I have a, uh, a dental practice um, that has been here for over 35 years. Uh, and that is my current role is I come to work every day in Pflugerville. Uh, what were you doing in 1965 when Pflugerville was born? Well, in 65, uh, I was um, intimately involved in fifth grade uh, in Dallas and uh, was uh, uh, learning my way around, uh, that was a new school for, for me in fifth grade, and I was learning my way around uh, a new uh, campus that we had in Dallas. Uh, where did you do your uh, college work and then your, uh, your well, that would be pre-dental and then dental school? Sure, all my undergraduate work was done at the University of Texas here in Austin, uh, and then I went back to Dallas to uh, Baylor College of Dentistry in Dallas. Uh, and did uh, all of that work there. And then as soon as I graduated from uh, dental school, I moved down here to Pflugerville in 1979. How did you uh, determine Pflugerville was the destination? That's an interesting question. Um, I had uh, another dentist that I knew who was practicing in Austin at the time, uh, and he had multiples of patients um, that he had generated uh, through uh, a basketball coach, a, a women's basketball coach uh, that was here at Pflugerville High School, a guy named Jerry English, uh, was a very good friend of his and uh, uh, he started getting all sorts of folks to come to see Dr. Stafford uh, and so uh, when I was about to graduate, Dr. Stafford asked me what I was doing uh, when I graduated and I said, well, I, I'm just kind of got open ears right now for anything that comes along in opportunity. Uh, and he said, well, you know, there's a little town outside of Austin, uh, and, and I have some folks that come to visit with me, and we think that uh, this little area has, uh, has potential to grow. It's not very big right now, uh, but, but we think that uh, this might be a good time to, to come in and start getting roots in the, in the community and, and uh, to see if we can uh, uh, bring a service to the people of Pflugerville. And so where did you, uh, what was the location of your practice in Pflugerville? We started out in a place that was called, at that point in time, was called Wood Creek Village, uh, which was uh, at the corner of Pecan and, um, Railroad. and Railroad. Yeah, that's where it was. And we were, gosh, it was us uh, and um, I think a, a hair and nail shop uh, and the newspaper, the small newspaper that was going on. Uh, and there may have been something else, but that was there was not much going on. Uh, we, we sort of identified with the uh, volunteer fire department across the street. To tell people where we were. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what was your impression of the town? The business folks that you met um, next door or within the town? So wonderfully genuine uh, was my first impression. Uh, everybody was very friendly. Um, it was different because I had come from uh, Dallas, which was um, huge and fast. Uh, and, uh, and, and still growing in leaps and bounds and lots of traffic. Uh, and, and this was not quite that way back in 79. It was smaller, uh, much smaller, uh, and, uh, and, and there was, but there was such a greater sense of community uh, within that. I mean, everybody knew everybody and I didn't know anybody. And so uh, it, it just, I, I thought, no, I can do this because these people are all so genuine and, and uh, they were really interested in me as an individual, let alone as in me as a dentist. And obviously you built those relationships. You lived in the community, were respected by the community. So eventually uh, was elected to an office as uh, I was elected to the Pflugerville ISD Board of Trustees uh, and uh, was immediately um, um, appointed secretary of the board uh, in those early years. And so uh, um, it was, uh, that was a wonderful opportunity. Uh, frankly, besides agriculture, that was about the only industry in town at that point. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a great outlet to learn more about the city and the community because everyone loved high school football and girls basketball and all the things that the kids uh, were involved with and, and uh, it, it was wonderful to see 
so much parental involvement in the kids' lives during their period in school? Uh, as uh, a trustee, one of the things that you did was to attend graduation or commencement exercises. Tell us what they were like uh, in your period of service. Well, that, uh, that changed uh, over the 15 years that I was on the board. Um, we finally, uh, in, in the early years, uh, it was pretty easy to, uh, to, to do it either at the, the field or in the gym if it was raining or somewhere like that because we didn't have uh, huge numbers of graduates. But uh, before long, because we grew so incredibly fast, uh, we had to pick another venue uh, to get all our kids across the stage, so we began to go down to uh, uh, down to the University of Texas uh, to the drum uh, and began graduating our classes uh, uh, there uh, in, in that facility because it was big enough for us to, to hold all of our, our graduates and the students and the families uh, and the grandparents and all the others uh, that supported uh, those kids. As the community grew and the subdivisions popped up, that meant the chore of building new schools. So tell us about your role again as a trustee in that process of selecting sites, working with architects, and opening the schools. Uh, great question. Um, it didn't take us long in our growth pattern to realize we needed to shoot a little further ahead with picking sites for schools. The, the, the magic in that was trying to figure out where developers were going to be placing new developments uh, ahead of time because if we didn't, they would build them out and then there was no room in the development to have a school building. So it, it became pretty tricky to, to go in and, and uh, uh, we literally would drive around the district and count houses uh, and count heads in houses to try to figure out what the numbers would mean for us as far as needing new buildings and new campuses. And so uh, that became more and more of a challenge as we grew so rapidly. Uh, but we would go in and find uh, where the centers of population would be developed and then try to pick a site as quickly as possible as we could uh, to try to put usually an elementary school to, to feed that new development into, uh, but not long after new middle schools and, and then ultimately new high schools as well. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a daunting task uh, as fast as things were growing. There were several years where we were the fastest growing school district in the state of Texas, uh, and that means a whole lot of building all at one time, uh, following the construction along, seeing that it was going right. We had to hire uh, people to come in and just run the construction aspect for the district, which we hadn't done before. Uh, our superintendent at the time, uh, was so busy trying to watch construction and, and figure out curriculas and do budgets and do all of this that we just we grew too fast to be able to have him be able to do that all the time. So, so then the administration began to grow because we just didn't have a choice. One man couldn't be in eight places at one time. So, uh, so that caused us to grow uh, both administratively as well. Your role as a trustee then, uh, you also had oversight on the buildings and would do walkthroughs with your fellow board members. Uh. We, uh, we, we got to a point to where before we accepted a brand new building, um, we as a board would literally walk through. Even before that, we would accept an architectural plan uh, that we felt like would work for us uh, through a, a great system of architects that we had back then. And, and we would look at the plans and we would discuss that with the architect and, and the pros and cons of doing it this way or that way. And then once the school was built, um, then we would literally go in and walk the building. We would walk the halls and we'd look in the classrooms, we'd walk the kitchen and all the common areas. Uh, the, the, the gym and uh, the, the kitchens, the, the, the cafeteria eating areas, the auditoriums, the stage, uh, everything we could to look at it to see that it was in an acceptable condition for us uh, to be able to, to, uh, to, to make an approval on that because we had to vote as a board whether we approved it or not. So we had to come in and look at it and we wanted to see it. We wanted to see what was going on and the quality of the construction. Uh, again, in those early years or in the 70s, uh, in the fast growth, uh, the dollar resources were somewhat limited. How, uh, what was the challenge of funding the new growth uh, that you might have encountered? You know, we, we had to, 
each capital project had a bond issue that would come with that. Sometimes we had a bond issue just to buy property by sites at the time to do that with. And, and there was a few sites that we bought that ended up not being good sites because the development didn't actually go close enough to that location for it to be good. So we missed on a couple of those, not too many, but some that we did. And each time you had to build a building or build a building and buy sites, you had to float a bond issue. The, the school district didn't have the money to just go out and start paying cash for construction in, in real estate uh, areas to, to, to build the schools on, so we had to vote bond issues through. Well, that's a challenge for a school district, and, and you had to make sure that the, the, the people, the taxpayers of the district, really understood the bond package. What were we really buying with this money that we were going to be asking the taxpayers to pay, and, and, and how could we make sure that we utilize that money specifically for the project that we told the taxpayers that would be going to. And, and so uh, we, we the, in order to get the trust of the community, we had to be very transparent with all of that, be very upfront with all of that, uh, and, and make sure that everybody understood this goes to this building and nothing else. And so once we did that, we had to follow through with that. Otherwise, we would have not ever voted a bond issue again. You know, once you, once you lose the taxpayer's trust, you're in trouble. Uh, another, uh, I would imagine, a cost-saving uh, initiative was you had, uh, I would say, clones of buildings that you were able to replicate because you found that it was a good design and maybe just tweak that? Uh. Exactly. We, we ended up, through several different designs, trying to figure out which one was going to be the best for us. And, and we were working with a company called HW, SHW back then, which was our architect. And we, we found that um, uh, we had one building that really suited our purposes at the elementary level very nicely. Um, the district ended up saving lots of money because the same plan could be used for multiple elementary schools. And, and through the use of that plan, we kept having success with that. So we saved architectural fees by using the same plan. Obviously, we varied colors and patterns and, and, uh, and tiles and this kind of thing. And it sort of depended on whether we built that out in the Pflugerville area or we crossed the line into Austin because Austin had a different set of, of standards that we had to use to build in Austin versus what we would build out here. Even though the plan was the same, uh, codes and other things made that change uh, once you got into the city of Austin. So were you on the board when Conley High School was built? I was on the board that when Conley. That was second high school. That was a big deal. Yes, it was. We, it, was uh, uh, it, it was kind of amazing. We found that property over there. It, it probably... It was in a really good location, but the amount of property was really tight. Uh, but we still were able to get everything on that we wanted to get on. Uh, it, it's, it was a beautiful site. Nellie Connolly uh, came when we on the on the day we dedicated it. It was a it was an awesome day, uh, and and that was a, that was a really neat school. But but you know that was the the second high school for us, which was huge for this district because uh, when you go from one high school to a second high school, it really changes the dynamic of how things work and, and uh, uh, what do you do with your athletic facilities? Do you try to use a common facility? Do you have to build more stadiums? All these questions were kind of new territory for us and, and uh, uh, we had to get through all of that as best as we could. And that actually had been a dairy farm before it became the high school. Yes, I, I'm not sure what all was on that property before. Besides the rabbits that were out there, uh, it, it was, uh, there were a lot of guys that I talked to afterwards who said, oh, we used to hunt dove on that property all the time. Uh, and I thought, wow, that was a while back, I guess. I'm sorry we took that away from you, but that's progress, so. Uh, about your school board meetings, about what was the duration of a meeting? <laughs> wow. When I first got on, we had some long meetings, uh, and, and I, I, I don't know whether we just kind of couldn't get focused on to what we were really talking about, or, or what. some of those meetings went to 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and uh, that sure made for a long next day at work. Uh, and, and we just, we, we sort of, over a few years of, of having the honor of serving on the board, 
And I could just kind of tell there were certain things that we spent more time on, way more time on, that I felt like that we really needed, uh, to, should be spending. Uh, and, and we could have gotten to the, to, the, to the end of that hunt a lot faster if we had just sort of focused a little bit better on what we were doing. Uh, later on, those meetings got a lot shorter uh, and they were a lot more hospitable. Uh, so any other issues on the school front that you recall either dealing with teachers or students or codes, dress codes, uh, organizations, uh, the multitude of... You just hit a long list of things uh, that were, were going on. Always you have um, every district uh, that, that cares about what's going on evaluates their personnel. That's just part of the package of what we do. We wanted, we wanted the most qualified, best individual to be a teacher that we could find. We didn't care where they came from. If they were here, awesome. If they came from Alaska, awesome. It didn't really matter. We just wanted the most qualified, most dedicated individual we could find. Well, over the years, sometimes, you know, that doesn't always hold. And, and so through the evaluation process, not often, but sometimes we'd have a teacher that would come up that, that we felt like was, was not able to, to carry the kind of standards that we were trying to hold them to uh, and, and you know you have situations like that and, and sometimes they just need to move along and, and so as, as much as we hated doing that the other side of that coin was now we have the opportunity to fill this position with, with something more that we're looking for okay well that happens from time to time obviously uh, discipline problems with kids come along uh, we had great principals at our campuses and, and it was a rare day that we would come in and have a student issue actually that would come up uh, from time to time because we had such great principals at our campuses and, and so that was that's something that was I don't, I'm not even sure we had maybe one or two of those and, and uh, perhaps an expulsion issue that came along. Uh, and then, you know, the, the county laws began to change and, and uh, if it was a real discipline problem, Gardner Betts was out there that we could send the kids to that if they were really um, in, a, in a situation that was a more severe situation, we could always rely on, on some help from, from the county for some of those kids. But that was even a rare situation as well. So we, we, had, uh, we, were, we were lucky to have not too many of those. Were y'all recognized as an honor board during your period? Um, we were, uh, in, in the honor. It's a huge thing. Uh, well, it, it was a huge thing, and and I I uh, uh, I have um, uh, that was a really special time for us as a board. The honor board situation is every year the the, the Texas uh, um, Association of School Boards. Uh, has a, a, a spring meeting and I think it's in May sometime and, and uh, every year they have a, kind of a contest called the honor board contest in, in boards out of the thousand plus school districts in the state of Texas are, are able to come in and, and um, sort of enter the contest if you will uh, about uh, presenting their board as, uh, as as one of the best boards in Texas and then then the the, uh, the convention takes those boards and and hones it down to, to one final board uh, as as uh, as is awarded the honor board of the state of Texas for that year and it's the best board in the state uh, and, and so we were uh, I believe it was in 1996 that we were um, our superintendent felt like we uh, we should enter that fray uh, and so uh, we uh, we did, but gosh, th we were building. We had so many school buildings we were building at that point in time. The board almost just didn't. We didn't know how to prepare for something like that. Didn't know what to do with something like that. So we were trying to to get buildings built and have roofs over kids' heads. And and uh, uh, and, and our superintendent at the time, Mr. Spoonmore, was uh, uh, was unbelievable in in sort of putting the package together that would present us uh, to the convention uh, as, as a possibility. And there was this big, long series of, of steps we had to go through. The, the package had to be accepted, and then, then, there, was a, uh, then there was an interview process uh, that we got honed down to, and, and, uh, and then once we got into the interview contest, the, part of that, then, then the, uh, a, a board of superintendents were the judges for that, and I think we got down to five schools that were finalists, five school districts, and, and uh, I remember that that interview process with those uh, with all those superintendents from great districts all the way around, and, and we were 
we were in high cotton, so to speak, uh, to be with the other districts that were there. I mean, uh, the Woodlands, I think, was there, and, and some friendship was there, and, and uh, uh, districts that we had just been in total awe of because of their tremendous successes that they had had. Uh, and our interview went well. Uh, I mean, I think we were, our, our board was, was wonderfully engaged with the questions that they asked uh, us. And, and um, uh, so we just felt like we were, we'd already won because we'd made it to the top five and we didn't expect anything after that whatsoever. Uh, and, and so when we got on the stage and, and uh, uh, all, they had all five boards on the stage in front of the entire convention, there must have been two or 3,000 people there at this convention at the George R. Brown Center in Houston. Uh, and, and they announced and, and it was us. And I was so shocked. Uh, I just thought, wait a minute, what about the Woodlands? What about these other guys, you know? And, and, uh, uh, and, and it, was, it was such an honor because our guys had worked so hard uh, they had done so much work in, in keeping their ears to the ground and, and uh, uh, realizing the importance of parental involvement with the kids in the school and, and it rallied everybody up. And it, it was just a, a really neat thing, but we all knew as board members there was no way that we would even be close to doing that if we didn't have an, ama an amazing administrative staff, including the superintendent. I mean, they're, they're the ones that made it all possible for us. We just kind of showed up. Well. The school has traditionally been the ambassador for the city because our students and like in your case, the school board, the name Pflugerville has gotten out in the area and in the state in a very positive way. I'm gonna go back to your practice for a moment. You eventually moved your practice then from the Wood Creek uh, Village to uh, a new present location. And tell us about that move and why you decided to move. Well, um, we were, we were growing with Pflugerville at the time, and, and our little location in, in Wood Creek Village was, uh, I don't know if it was even 600 square feet. It was very, very small. Uh, and it, I'll put it this way, people in the waiting room up at the front of the office could hear every one of my phone conversations in my private office while they sat there and, and listened. So it was, it, you can see it was a small office to say the least. Uh, and and we, had a, we had a restaurant that moved in next door to us in the Wood Creek Center. And um, the, 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 the morning after uh, old food um, uh, aroma that was left every morning we walked in began to kind of get us a little bit. Uh, and I had been approached uh, by someone who was building a new building up in our current location and said, you know, would you be interested at all in looking? I said, I'd be happy to look and see what it is, and they began to, to, to make a, a, a deal with us that was gonna be suitable for us. So we, uh, we ended up moving up to our current location up at 15300 uh, FM 1825 uh, in 1986, uh, after we started in 79 here, and, and have been at that location ever since. Uh, you've seen the practice of dentistry change over the decades too. Uh, and I don't know that we want to go into that today, <laughs> but uh, um, thank you for your service to the citizens and the dental care. Um, lastly, is there, are there any characters in the city uh, that you would like to, to tell about? In other words, uh, game changers or just interesting uh, folks that you've met through the years, uh, maybe business owners or whatever? Yeah, I, I, I don't... I've always had a great relationship with the guys that were doing all the farming here in town, you know, and, and all the big families, the Weisses, the Bowles, the Flugers, uh, you know, all of them were, they've all been great folks for us uh, to, to, to get to know and, and we respected them and, and, and their heritage, you know, how they were brought up and how this place changed slowly but surely uh, to, to, to really put us on the map uh, from, from a very small, quaint German farming town to something that the growth is just splitting at the seams with, even to this day, it has grown so fast and is still growing. Um, I think one of the things that, that kind of put Flugerville on the map was Deutschenfest years ago. You know, the first, I think one of the first things that, uh, that I got involved in when I, when I got here 
somebody said, well, are you going to do something with Deutsche Invest? I said, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, and, and so once I started looking at it, it was just this great festival that was a local festival with a beauty pageant and a parade and, and, and all of this. And, and uh, I mean, all I could relate to was the Cotton Bowl Parade in Dallas because that's where I was raised. And I think, well, maybe it's not quite that big. And, and so uh, it turns out it wasn't, but it was just so much fun. So my first Deutschen Fest, I said, you know, y'all put me where you need me. I, I'll just, I want to volunteer to help with this thing. And, and so um, I got backstage with the electrician and we were trying to figure out how to have enough plugs for enough hair dryers to all be running at the same time for the girls that were in the beauty pageant uh, to, to be able to make that without blowing up the building. Uh, so that was uh, that was so much fun. We managed to be able to get it all done and 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 help the girls change the costumes and and uh, I mean that was just it was just a really awesome time and and uh, it's one of the one of the funnest things I remember when I first got here was uh, was that first Orchard Fest for me. So that's when they had the Miss Dorchin Fest, was, and that was in the uh, gymnasium on the Timmerman campus. It was a dome-shaped. Uh, exactly. And they had uh, celebrities from Austin to come out and do the MC in, and I think they even had a swimsuit competition. Or, you or know, I don't even remember that. This, yeah, they, they had, they, I know they had a talent competition. I know they had an evening dress competition. I don't know if they had uh, the swimsuit competition or not. I just don't recall that. It's just too long to remember. Well, volunteerism has been a big thing in the community over the decades and um, we can see that aspect in, in many ways and one of which was the volunteer fire department which you you recall you were you could see them across the street I guess. Absolutely I mean we would we would watch those guys uh, we could always tell when an alarm had gone off not because there was a buzzer at the building we could just see all the pickup trucks coming to the station you know in rapid succession and knowing oh there's got to be a fire somewhere and so they would go out and and do their thing and take off and we'd hear the sirens and and uh, uh, not that it was you know every five minutes uh, but but we just knew that was that was something that was happening and and, uh, uh, and and those guys what a great service they did I mean and they were they came from all over Pflugerville to come in and, and and do the thing and then you know not too long after that the fire department had to grow because we were growing uh, and and uh, it's always been uh, it's always been great there's a, it's a great bunch of guys what about uh, eating places uh, did you bring your lunch to work or did you go out for a snack you know there wasn't much uh, going out for a snack uh, in the local area back when I first got here I think uh, I think the the only fast food place was uh, the gas station that Norman Johnson had uh, in fast food back then was uh, two pieces of bread and a piece of bologna slapped together by Mr. Johnson uh, and given to you on a piece of wax paper. Uh, that was fast food. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, Knievel's was here. The barbecue place was here. Uh, and But that was only one day a week on, on uh, Fridays. You could get barbecue. Uh, and, and so there just wasn't really much fast food. I think the first literal fast food place that came into town was probably the uh, the, the golden fried chicken uh, place that came up. Uh, and, and there were rumors, oh, for years there were rumors, oh, McDonald's is coming, McDonald's is coming, you know, and we went, okay, all right, let's see, and, and nothing would happen, you know. So in the meantime, I think after the golden chick came in, uh, I think the Sonic came up after that, uh, and, and Sonic really came in. Town. Yeah, and that was on the outskirts of town, uh, about two tenths of a mile up uh, toward 35, and so uh, um, that, was a, that was a big deal when Sonic opened up. Uh, and, but that was when Heather Wild, the, the development had started growing and, and there were people in there uh, to do that with. Um, you still received uh, mail at the post office near your office then to begin with. Yeah, we, we had a post office box because that was the way mail came back then was a P.O. box. And so I'd walk across the parking lot from, from my office at Wood Creek and walk over to the post office and go check my mail every few days and, and, and see what was going on with that. And, and, uh, uh, and then, and, and I think just about everybody got mail through the post office box. We didn't have a real house-to-house uh, uh, -house delivery system system at that point in time when I first got here. That changed, of course, later on, but uh, uh, man, there were a lot of post office boxes, so that's how we did it. So what do you see as the future for the community, our, um, the city, the school? 
your office? I, I think five and fifty years uh, now. Yeah. Uh, I might not be practicing 50 years from now, um, uh, but uh, uh, I think this city has done such a great job of realizing that growth is coming whether you like it or not. Uh, and, and that was one of the things early on, it, it seemed like, you know, we don't want to deal with this growth. Well, let's just let's just act like we're kind of not here for a while and, and maybe it'll go away, you know. And I had seen growth in Dallas come at, at an unbelievable pace and, and I knew this was already starting to show little bitty signs of, of getting big. And, and I mean, obviously now when you go out to, you know, 130 and, and 45, that's the whole new center of Pflugerville, it seems like. It's coming whether you like it or not. And so I think that the, the response of the, of the folks in Pflugerville now that realize that that's going to happen and so we need to plan for that. And, and I think that we just need to understand that, that planning for growth is, is the right way to, to look at it, not thinking, well, I think it's going to go by us this time. I don't think that's the right way to approach it. And, and I think the city fathers, the city council, those guys have done a great job in, in trying to realize, yeah, we're going to have to, to provide services for people because there's more and more coming. We need to be able to keep up with water. Uh, with with electrical, with all the things that has to come in. I mean, water in our drought, that's a big concern right now, you know, that, that we that we have enough water to go around to everybody. And so, so you know, people that are smarter than me, I'm sure, are planning for stuff like that. And I see Pflugerville just being, you know, I think it's going to be Austin, Pflugerville, Round Rock, Georgetown, and there will be no difference in there anywhere. There'll be no divisions in that like there have been in years past. It's just going to be all one thing. Uh, and, and so that's just come in. I think we'll practice. We'll have a, uh, I've got years to go with my practice. I, I, I love it too much to walk away from it at this point in time. And, and I've had a lot of people ask me, are you going to retire soon? And I finally got a little, you know, um, a little concerned about that because I finally asked somebody, I said, is it because I look like I need to, to retire from my practice? Is why you're asking me about to do that? And they know, no, we just know you've been here for a long time. And, and I said, you know, I'm not going to retire just yet. I've got maybe a good 10 years left to, to go. And, and uh, if, if the Lord's willing and, and keeps my hands in good shape, then we're going to be good to go with that. Well, thank you, Jeff, very much, uh, particularly for your recap of stories, for your service uh, to our school and education in the community, and for the health of our citizens. Thanks, Verna Jean. My pleasure.